I gotta tell you about the game that Michael Jordan in the playoff, he was in 95, 96 season. He got a game that he played with a flu. He played with flu. He, he went out and then got 40 points. It was like, this man is amazing. I just said that to my parents. He went out there and got 40 points with, with flu. That's, that's, that's the thing to admire. There, there are kids who end up going to colleges who have no idea that the people around them have been paid off. They don't have a clue. They, they don't know. You know, they just think, hey, I'm going to this university because that university liked me. They don't understand that the AAU coach cut a deal behind their back. You know, where the AAU coaches, or, the, or even the high school coach, there are a lot of high school coaches that are on the take. Um, it, it is, it, there is a cesspool of corruption and, and adult, criminal, immoral, obscene behavior going on, you know, behind the scenes. 15, 20 years ago, rookies were 22 years old, 23 years old, and they sat on the bench. And maybe when they were 24 or 25, they came around and made contributions. Uh, today, rookies are 18 and 19 years old. And a lot of times, they're drafted very high in the draft, and teams don't have the luxury of waiting three or four years for that player to turn around. So a lot of times, that player has to play right away. One of the most important factors with a young player is what kind of character does this kid have? You know, is he going to have what it takes to to work for two or three years if he doesn't play? Uh, is he mature enough to handle, you know, being in a locker room with guys who are 33 and 34 years old that are adults, that are families that have children, maybe have children in their teens? And here's a kid who is 17 years old. So a lot goes into the decision. Um, at the end of the day, there's still an awful lot of risk associated with taking a high school player. You'd prefer to be able to look at this kid for four years in college before you make your decision. But they just give us the rules. You know, all we ask as general managers is for the Players Association and the NBA, give us the rules, and then we'll work within the rules and we'll make those decisions. It's manipulation. If you really want to break it down, it's manipulation. The television and music, and television's smart. They connect to music, which is another. So you have TV, you have music, and you have print. You connect these three, and then you give these kids hope, which is what they want. And you give them hope. If you wear this, you can be here. And that's all, it's really not that hard. I mean, I'd fall for it when I was 14, especially if I had nothing. These kids 
are doing nothing different than we did. They're just doing it on a larger level, and that is they're living vicariously through their heroes. And there's nothing more amazing than imagining being in that person's shoes. Literally, in their shoes, and that's why they're spending $130 on a shoe, and figuratively, in their shoes. The problem is, a Michael Jordan comes around about as often as a Pete Sampras. NBA has become global. You've got guys walking the street in America right now who 10 years ago or even five years ago would have been first round NBA draft picks. But because now there are so many more players internationally playing basketball. You know, Yao Ming's in the NBA, there are a billion people in China. And there are millions of kids who five years ago would have never thought about picking up a basketball. But now, because of Yao Ming, you've got little kids in China now dribbling basketballs where you would have never seen that a decade ago. I think right now one of the challenges is, in general, we live in our country in a celebrity culture. And really that's becoming worldwide now because of the Global Village and what McLuhan was on to uh, years ago. And so the fascination with celebrity and uh, the attractiveness of celebrity I think from a very young age is something that shapes uh, our world and we see it on television and magazines and on the internet uh, so whether it's movie stars uh, both in sports and entertainment uh, that is something that people really aspire to have and the trappings that come with it uh, the bling bling the Bentleys the mansions you know, with NBA lifestyle I think most kids really feel they have the dream to play in the NBA. Most of them feel they have a good chance, where the reality is they have a better chance of hitting the New York City lottery. If you just look at it mathematically or statistically, uh, you have a better chance of getting hit by lightning or hit the New York City lottery than you do of playing in the NBA. At the IMG Basketball Academy, as I said, we, we work with NBA veterans, we work with rookies, we work with guys who've been in the league, who've played over in Europe, who are trying to get back in. We work with high-level major college players, we work with Division II and Division III players, we work with kids who are trying to become college players. Uh, and, and a lot of these guys, and when I was coaching in high school, they get the same story. They have people around them who have absolutely no credibility who have absolutely no expertise in the area telling them how good they are or how good they can be. Uh, and so then as, as a coach, you, you spend a lot of time trying to get their expectations to become more realistic. <laughs> I think I took basketball very seriously when a guy just found me in my hometown when I was playing um, pickle games, found me and took me to his took me to his practice and just working me out an hour, two hours a day. So that's when I took basketball very seriously. So that was when I was thirteen and when I was thirteen I became the, the youngest player to play the semi-pro league in Puerto Rico. For years, the way that, that you developed as a basketball player, um, you played youth basketball or you played for your middle school team and then you competed for your high school team. And um, then as, as you became a good quality high school player, as college coaches became aware of your ability and your talent, they would contact the high school coach. Uh, and the high school coach would then assist that player on his high school team with trying to navigate the recruiting process and the high school coach became a real um, a real vital part of that of that process within the last uh, you know maybe it's 10 15 20 years probably in the last you know couple of decades um, 
outside basketball or AAU basketball has become more prevalent. But there are restrictions put in place by every high school basketball association that as the high school coach who really has the most contact with this kid in an educational setting from say eight in the morning until three in the afternoon, there are only certain periods of time that I can even be working with him in the gym. As a high school coach, what, what I would run into is that in the month of September, for example, I'm not supposed to work with my players in the off season. I'm not supposed to be able to train them and work them out in the gym. However, if I'm an AAU coach, if I'm just literally some guy off the street with a criminal record who sends the forms into the AAU office and gets approved, um, I can put a team together and literally practice every single day of the year. I heard about NG Academy like three years ago. I was seeing it in a magazine. But when I saw the, the, the money thing, it was so expensive. So uh, uh, the guy who took me here in the summer, he had the way to brought me in. So I came here in the, in the in April. I saw it. I like it. And I came here in August. A guy can come from the outside, anybody off the street can start an AAU program. And if I can get somebody to bankroll what I'm doing, if I can get, um, if I can get Adidas or Nike or a shoe company to, th there, are, there are AAU coaches who are making more money than high school coaches and even some college coaches because the shoe companies know that, that if I'm the AAU coach and I've got connections in this, in say Chicago or New York or whatever, that I can get my hands on the best players, then Adidas might pay me $75,000 a year to travel around and play in all their tournaments. Uh, again, no academic requirements, really no social requirements whatsoever, um, no behavioral requirements, no, nothing other than the fact you're a good basketball player, you come play on our team. I got a scholarship because this guy knows very well the, the guy that runs the, the high school in the nation. So he had the connection with the coach, so he brought me here. We have absolutely created a monster in, in basketball with, with the values that, that are being really passed down from adults to the kids. You know, the kids learn this behavior from the adults, and the kids understand that, you know, it's kind of a game, and everybody's just trying to get over. So now the kid spends his time trying to kind of cut the best deal for himself. Well, you're offering me two pairs of shoes, but, you know, he's offering me sweats, shoes, and a couple hundred bucks a game. I'm going to go with this guy. Forget about the fact that, that you saved me out of a bad situation. Forget about the fact that when I was 10 years old, you stepped in and mentored me for the last four years and tutored me and helped me in school. You know what? He's offering me 200 bucks a game. Screw you. I didn't want to go, I didn't want to come because I didn't want to leave my home. But see, sometimes you got to do sacrifice for good stuff, so I did it. Within the last 10 to 12 years, there, there was an incredible influx of high school players and players that attended college for one year or two years going pro immediately. And uh, the NBA has instituted a minimum age recently at 19 years old. 
so you won't have the high school player coming in, but you'll still have freshmen, sophomores, and juniors leaving college early. What effect has that had on the game? Our product is, is now a much younger uh, product than it was 15 years ago. See, 16, 17, and 18 year olds was not a huge market for the NBA years ago. It was 25 to 35 range. Well now, what's more interesting than an 18 year old tuning in to watch LeBron, who's 18? The point guard for the Los Angeles Clippers, Sean Livingston, he's like skinnier than me. And he played with the, with the big guys. I say, if he can do it, why not I can do it? The problem is the, the numbers, the percentages are so small with regards to the Amaris and the Kevins and the Germains and the Kobe's, but those are the ones that we read about. You don't read about the 200 to 300 a year who drop out of high school and say, I'm gonna go to the NBA. I don't think the NBA keeps statistics on, on the guys who forego college, sign with an agent, and never get drafted. Why would they do that? TV tends to glamorize uh, the individual, and it doesn't always accentuate uh, the qualities or the characteristics that go into great teams. And so the focus is on the dunk or a fancy dribble uh, or a fancy pass. And all those tend to bring a focus to the individual uh, versus the team concept. And so I think just naturally through, you know, sports center highlights, uh, through, you know, uh, basketball cards, through uh, the N1 videos uh, that kids enjoy watching, through the video games that kind of highlight individual players with all their kind of crafty and creative moves. Um, and there's a balance for individual expression. Bob Cousy was a great team player, so was Magic Johnson, so was Isaiah Thomas. Uh, but there was also a functional, practical payoff uh, to some of their creative abilities, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not that you can't have a little flair or a little style like a musician or an artist or anybody that has creative gifts or skills or, or abilities, but the key is, uh, are you able to integrate those skills and abilities in a way to help a team win and to help your teammates be better? There's so much more of a selfish attitude now amongst the players that play in the NBA. I think one is because the kids are so much younger, and two, because there's so much more money involved now. You got the majority of the players make more than the coach, and so they have so much money. If the team is doing bad, well, then they're more apt to replace the coach than to than the player in 99% 99 of the cases. So the player's not stupid. The player knows that. So he has this guy uh, trying to discipline him and trying to get him to do something. If he chooses not to do it, well then in the back of his mind he's thinking, well, if I don't do it, well then, you know, then it's going to be him before it's going to be me. The money has changed, you know, the game and the athlete to a great degree. Um, you know, I played in the NBA. I came in when I was 22 years old and I signed a contract with the Washington Bullets. You know, I made more money than my dad ever made my first year. And I thought it was more money than I could ever spend. Okay, of course, in today's standards, it's, it was, it's almost nothing. You know, it's like a, not even a shoe contract endorsement for the 12th guy on the team. Um, and today, the money is basically in millions of dollars. Even the, the lowest paid player on a team makes $400,000. So um, the money is a lot bigger today, and it goes to players at a younger age. And that's really challenging for young people to get a million or a five million or a $15 million contract when you're 18 years old. I'm not so sure how many people could handle something like that. So you now have 18, 19, and 20 year olds who can play physically in the pros, which you didn't have before. Um, and they're exciting to watch. Young legs are very exciting, very entertaining. Guys who can jump out of the gym is exciting. The problem is, they might be ready, 17, 18, and 19 year olds might be ready physically to play the game, which has really changed the game, and it's great TV. An 18 year old jumping out of the gym, it's like Cirque du Soleil, but they're not any more advanced mentally and emotionally. So there's your rub. You've got high school kids who are unbelievably entertaining, who make people ooh and ah, and it's exciting to watch, and I pay for it. But 
what we forget is, hold on. I don't know if that guy's ready to have a cup thrown at him. He might run into the stands. Oh, he did run into the stands? No way, I can't believe that happened. We're bombarded not only by hundreds of games a week, but by thousands of ads, both on the internet, television, radio, print media, uh, utilizing endorsements by athletes. And uh, I think it's had a, a substantial effect on, uh, as you know, we've got uh, young golfers and young soccer players and, and, and young athletes signing endorsement contracts in the multi-millions when they're 17 and 18 years old and haven't played a game yet. And uh, so I think it has had a substantial impact on, uh, on our youth. The entertainment industry and, 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 and sports have kind of blended you know, to a degree. You know, rap stars want to be basketball players, basketball players want to be rap stars. And, you know, all you got to do is watch videos and, 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 and get, a, get a pretty good idea of, of where those values are. The values are, I can be a complete, horrible human being, but if I've got clothes, if I've got cash, if I've got jewels, if I've got cars, if i got hoes, I've made it. And, and, and when you have 10, 11, 12-year-olds who see that as success, you, you've got entirely dysfunctional populations of people. There are a lot of parents who just haven't done their job and when, when kids then are either left on their own or they're allowed to be influenced by people on the outside, you're rolling the dice. They may get hooked up with somebody who really cares about them and in that case they should be thankful for that or they may get hooked up with some guy who is literally pimping them. Money is so powerful but to be like Mike across the be like Michael Jordan. You're talking about a gentleman who came into our life and it, there may only be one person like him in our lifetime. There may only be one person like him yet we're being told to be like him. How? Oh, you want to know how? Oh, well let me see. Okay, we have his shoe. Okay, now you can also get the jersey. What number is he? Who doesn't know what number he is? 23, baby. How do you know that? Because the jersey's everywhere. He retired 10 years ago. You know, so if you wear this and you, oh, and also, if you don't want the shoe and the jersey, we have Michael Jordan cologne. I mean, it doesn't stop. It's, it's everywhere. And you do this, you wear that, and you can get what he has. That's not true. When you go to recruit a kid these days, a player, to go to Division I school, it's almost like a very intense business endeavor where you have to lay out every single person that you're going to have to come in contact with. Oh, this is his barber who he, he may be talking to him one day and we want to get to him and you'll call him. You know, that's just how thorough you need to be. So it's, it's, gone, it's gone to a level that puts the kid in a tough position because with all these people getting after him like that or telling him how great he is and those type of things. And, and, and what, what we all know is that they're telling that to 10 different players. You become a head coach, it becomes more business. It's more like being a CEO with alumni and boosters and uh, the media and recruiting and fundraising. There's so many other dimensions or aspects other than basketball. And so the challenge there is how you're able to manage your time, manage your energy, uh, your psychic energy, your emotional energy, so that you could be at your best when you need your best, uh, when you hit the practice floor f with your kids. That's when you want to be at your best. That's your two and a half hours with them, and they deserve your best. And sometimes these other dimensions of the job could wear you down and make you less effective as a coach and a teacher. When I took over at UCLA, I knew the rules of engagement, which is if you're the head coach in basketball, you have to deliver the results and create the revenue necessary to support that athletic program. And that comes with the territory. If you're the manager of the Yankees, if you're the head football coach at Notre Dame, uh, that's the name of the game. So the key is being able to win enough and create enough revenue so you can do what you really love, which is to work with young people, uh, to be a part of their development, 
to watch them move on to different stations in life and to be a part of that process. You clearly miss the connection with the kids uh, when you're in broadcasting. You don't ever have the highs of making a run through the tournament or beating the number one team in the country or hitting a, a buzzer shot and running off the floor with your kids in that locker room. You're never going to have that experience as a broadcaster. But you also don't have the lows. There's no talk radio, no letters of the editor, no death threats, no extortion attempts, no espionage or sabotage within your athletic department, no coach jockeying to try and get your job, no booster trying to write a check on the back nine of Bel Air Country Club to buy you out. And so there's some control, and it's relatively a fairly normal, healthy, balanced existence in broadcasting. A kid who goes to college to become a better basketball player is probably doing the wrong thing because I'm not real sure how much better a kid really gets going to college. You know, a kid goes to college and, and he can't even practice with his coach until October the 15th. And then there's, there's only so many hours a week he's allowed to practice because he has to be making progress towards his degree, which is what he should be doing. But, you know, at the end of the year, how, you know, he's gotten a little bit older, he's learned, he's gotten more mature, but has his basketball skills really developed that much more? going to college. I'm not sure going to college is where you really become a better basketball player. I think when I first go to college, get a lot more stronger and get my education straight, all everything straight. The structure of the NBA, three years on a contract, a rookie deal, you can't change the deal. You got to go, you know, the collective bargaining agreement may change this summer. But as of right now, you're locked in for three years and then a fourth year at the team's option. So you're not a free agent. You can't earn what they would consider, you know, normal person would think the initial contract is the big money, but in relative terms it's not. You can't earn that until you're in four years. So from a business decision, if I were advising a young man in a business way, it's a better idea to do it. For example, Al Harrington at 22 began his second contract, whereas guys are going to college till they're 21, 22 years old, they're beginning that kind. So you're losing a whole contract in the deal, which could amount to anywhere from 20 to 60 million dollars. My dad, because he told me first that Basketball is your first love, but it's temporary. If you suffer an injury, what you have left? You have your diploma, you got your profession, and then you can live your rest of your life with that. The NBA right now is drafting on potential. Potentially what a kid could be five years from now. That's sad. That's sad. When we turn around and, and take a student and say, you know what, potentially, uh, you're an A-plus student, and we're gonna make you a doctor right now. Or do we tell that same youngster that you have to go and get your skills together to be a doctor, a medical doctor, okay? So it's no difference than doing what you have to do and laying the groundwork. We don't do that in sports. I'm going to tell you the, the truth. Uh, uh, I'm playing basketball because it's my first love. But I'm, I want to take basketball and make it in my life and take my mom, my dad, my brother out of Puerto Rico and just give, him, give my father and my mother back everything have they done for me, all the struggle have we been, been through and everything. It's just a reward for them for for pushing me into into this into my dream. Players that have stayed in school, very few of them it, it's benefited their draft position. So the stats all point towards if you sat down with a a high school player and went over the stats, be very little reason not to do it. If I make it to the NBA, I just say thank you, Lord, thank you. I just I just say the first thing I'm gonna say because 
it's been a, it's been a hard, long journey. Kids are better off staying in school, but there are exceptions. There are prodigies. There's Kevin Garnett's or a situation like Baron Davis at UCLA who had blown out his knee at the end of his freshman year, had recovered and played well in his sophomore year to position himself as the top three pick in the draft. If he comes back to UCLA, re-injures that knee, he may never have that window of earning power potential again in his life. And I, as a coach, wouldn't want in good conscience to try and sleep at night if he had come back because I convinced him, blew his knee out, and then as a result, didn't realize that $150 million he's made in the last eight years. My best friend, he plays for the Washington Wizards. And he was, we were playing the same high school team. So we were always watched or scouted by somebody in any game. So he went pro, this year he went pro. He, he always talking to me about me going pro too, but I, I don't like the idea. It's just, it's just a matter of changing so, so quickly to become a man. Because right now you're high school, you like, you lay low sometimes. You think like a young man, but you're talking about pro, you're talking about business. You gotta take care of business, and it's a man's game. And it's a, I don't know, if it's there, if I get a chance, I'm gonna tell you. To, I'm gonna lie to you. I go for it, but I don't. I don't want to push it, cause I'm not ready for it. The ABA is minor league basketball. Uh, it's minor league basketball with incredibly highly skilled players because the players that play in this league are all guys who either have been to the NBA, will eventually get to the NBA, or should be in the NBA. You know, the NBA has 350 players in it, 200 of which are the best players on the planet. There's nobody outside the NBA that's as good as those 200 guys. But the last 150 guys, which, be, which equates to the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th guy on every team, are no different than the guys in the gym in there right now. Just that one group was in the right place at the right time and ended up getting a guaranteed contract, another group wasn't. And I could, t I could take those players out of the league and take our players and put them in the league, it'd be no difference. They're just looking for a chance. Such a, it's such a roller coaster ride. You know, if you're not a person that's drafted in the NBA draft, you know, things are gonna be rough for you. And it's about, you know, being able to get up and go to work and stay in shape, get, you know, get better and whatever things that they tell you that you need to work on, continue to work on those things. But it's a roller coaster ride. You're going to have some highs and you have some lows. And it's usually the guys that persevere through all that that actually get to that next level. I just love it. And I'm going, you know, I ain't going to give it too much longer. But as of right now, this is all I know. There's a lot of guys that came from the ABA and the minor league that's in the league right now that's doing real good. So it's definitely hope. You know, when you think about the minor leagues, it's hope for a lot of players that 
probably be back in the projects right now doing nothing, getting in trouble, uh, committing crimes, uh, not being focused. You know, so it's definitely an opportunity. Every day that I play, you know, I'm blessed. And I've gotten two college degrees from it. You know, I could stop playing today and I, you know, I could still have a, a, a great life. I started playing basketball um, at the age of four. Basketball saved my life, took me out the ghetto. I was living in the projects, growing up in private in New Orleans, Louisiana, and, uh, you know, just dribbling that basketball. It took me a lot of places. You know, I, I go back to think back when I was in the projects, you know, a lot of kids didn't survive it, didn't survive the violence. You know, uh, the property was so bad, kids, most kids don't live to be 18. So, you know, a lot of guys, what, what we call, gave me a pass. They see me bouncing that ball like, you know what? Your boy might be so. You know, he could be a professional player. Uh, he got some skills and, you know, they gave me a pass, which the basketball took me away from the violence and the crime. I was able to dribble my self scholarship to the University of Houston. <laughs> We have nine teams in the CBA. This is the 60th anniversary of the CBA, and we put in hundreds and hundreds of players into the uh, NBA, as well as coaches, administrators, dance team members, and mascots. I think they come from all over. I think they're young, I think they're old, I think they're uh, the guys who have been in the NBA that for some reason have been bumped out by a younger guy um, and they need to find themselves again. I think they're guys that have a, something missing in their game that hopefully they can f figure out uh, uh, with their coaches and with the playing time that they'll get at the CBA level. Um, I think they're guys that just want a job professionally uh, and don't want to go overseas don't feel comfortable with the uh, difference in culture. So they, they stay here and they'll take less money, but they know that they love the sport and they want to play. Our players probably uh, at the bottom end uh, get about $500 a week for a 16 or 17 week season. Uh, possibly the upper end players are making 11 to $1,200 a week. <laughs> Well, my name is Jermaine Boyette. I've been on an NBA team at Utah Jazz and the Houston Rockets. And, you know, I just come here to better my chances and improve my skills to get to the NBA. When I was in fifth or fourth grade, I realized that I wanted to play um, in the NBA. Just because I used to grow up watching Michael Jordan, Master Johnson, Larry Bird, and basketball just came came easy for me. My name's Eric Chenoweth. I play for the Idaho Stampede. I'm the starting center for our team. I'm from Orange County, California. I went to Villa Park High School, then on to the University of Kansas. I got drafted by the Knicks in 2001. And I've been to camp with five different NBA teams and played in Europe and Asia and South America. I truly feel that I can't go on in life until, you know, I play in the NBA until I can't play anymore, and, uh, and it, it's kind of, it may sound odd, but it is, you know, I, it's when I'm 40 or 50 years old and I'm walking through the grocery store, people ask me, you know, did you play in the NBA? I want to be able to say yes, 
And that's what drives me right now. That, that, that simple question right there. Ricky Sanchez, I uh, play forward for the Idaho Stampede. Last time I saw you, I was in the middle of the decision, of the decision uh, of me, uh, making myself eligible for the NBA draft or going to college. So I turned out to be to go to, uh, to the NBA draft got picked by the Denver Nuggets. And uh, I ended up here by the decision they make to make King make me come here to develop. It was the best feeling I felt in my whole life. The, one, the bad part was I was by my I was by, I wasn't with my family. My family was back at home. Well, we, we we just went uh we went in berserk. We was like in our family. We was watching the the draft, and we went on and unexpected. You know, we just like everybody just like jumped up and uh, the joy. It was something else. When I heard my name, I couldn't breathe. I was breathing very, very, very fast. But uh, to tell you the truth, it was worth it. All that work I did the whole year at AMG, the, the last two months, it was hard. It was, it was tough. I was, I was thinking about to quit, to, to quit the draft, to get on my name out. But uh, I stood there and got through it. Decision. Time. It took me a lot of time with me and my family. We sat down and talked about it. Um, but I think it worked out for the best. Um, I think it was better for me because I think my, my thinking was I wasn't going to be a doctor or I wasn't going to be a lawyer. I just, like, my, my first instinct, it was like play basketball my whole life. And I just wanted to play basketball. I, I mean, the school is important, but my real love it was in basketball. When a child starts participating in sports, the adults have a responsibility to, to focus that child on what's truly important. The, the cliches that all of us believed when we started playing or all of us that, that have coached really believe in. Um, you know, building a team and being a part of a team and sacrificing for the good of everybody else. That it's not just about you. It's about the other 12 or 15 guys on your team. And that I sacrifice for you, you sacrifice for me. And uh, you do the same thing as a member of a family. I think it's a good thing to have aspirations to be an NBA player but you can't put all your eggs in one basket and say, that's what I want to be. You know, don't um, forego the opportunity to go to college. You know, at least try to get a year or two or three. You can always go back and get that extra year. So there's a lot of personal decisions that you have to make. But being involved, you know, with sports at an early age, I think is a good thing for all kids. Be realistic as to where you can go with your sport and be creative as to how many different things you could accomplish besides getting to the pros. You know, don't just play the game thinking that, you know what, just cause I got it going on right now, I could dunk, I could shoot, man, you know what, what's gonna happen when you can't? What else you gonna do? 
You know, now you're going back to the projects and you got to deal with all the people that think that you ain't keep it real with them. Stay in school, respect your parents, listen to your parents, and um, if you love the game, like you think you love it, and it's only, it's only a thought for kids right now, but just go after it. The message I was send to the young cats that's jumping out the gym and got all the athleticism in the world, if somebody tells you you can't dribble, you can't dribble. Take three months, work on your dribbling, and come back and say, look, I can dribble now. If they say you can't shoot, you can't shoot. I think people need to be true to themselves, you know, and um, not in a selfish way, but in a, in a way that you need to take care of yourself. I, I've always told, you know, I've, I've actually encouraged kids to come out of college early to get to the NBA to get those millions of dollars because, you know, once it's in your grasp, you mean they don't have it again. Before, before the draft, I knew if I was going to get picked, I was going to get sent to the development league to play and um, develop my skills. And I, I think that's the right thing for me because I don't want to go straight now to the NBA because I'm not ready yet. I think skill-wise, yeah, but physical-wise, I can't play with those guys. So I think that's the best for me. It's hard to give them everything, but not give them attention, which is the worst thing you could do. If you don't give them attention, you could give them merchandise, or you could give them anything that is you could buy, but you can't buy love. I think that's the ultimate goal, being the pros. But other than that, there's nothing gonna stop me. I can be broke. I can be. I can be without a home, and just still be playing. I can be like playing barefoot. And I can still be playing. So I can like. There's nothing that can stop me. When I saw, when I saw my dad and my mom going through all. With the problems that we went through, for me, I think there's nothing, there's no excuse for me to stop to give that to them. So I would say nothing will stop me. Mm -hmm.